This podcast is brought to you by sarahraven.com, which is home to everything you need for a truly beautiful and productive garden. You'll also find great and essential gardening kit and stylish, lovely things to have in your house to bring the outside indoors, all inspired by the garden and the house being tied together. There's also plenty of garden inspiration, how-to videos and specialist growing guides. So head over to sarahraven.com today to discover even more. Welcome to Grow Cookie to Range, the podcast of me, Sarah Raven. And today I'm joined by an old gardening friend and colleague, Corrine van Boxtel. I just want to describe how I know her, first of all. And then what we're going to talk about are naturalizing bulbs, which is Corrine's great passion and kind of skill set, really. But I met Corrine, in fact, on a dahlia trip, and I went to invited by her and another great Dutch friend, Dickie Skipper, to a Dahlia festival. And it's probably now about 15 years ago. And Jonathan Buckley, the photographer I work with, and I turned up and we had the most incredible, funny, but rewarding and creative day where all we ate was dahlias. We ate dahlia tubers, we ate dahlia flowers, dahlia petals. I think we ate dahlia leaves in a salad. I wasn't quite sure I liked those. Um, we drank <laughs> dahlia cordial. <laughs> we had everything dahlia. Anyway, um, from then, Karine and I have gone on looking at dahlias and bulbs. And I really feel her garden with a lawn, not big, probably about four meters by three meters in size. You look out of the bedroom window of her house over this lawn, wh whether you're there in January, February, March, April or May, and it looks ecstatically beautiful. It looks like that beautiful Botticelli Primavera painting of those beautiful toes standing in a sort of flower-filled sward. And Corrine, more than anyone I know, and any sort of area of grass I've ever seen has the most beautiful, beautiful flower bulb studded grass in her garden. And that's what I wanted her to talk about. So welcome, Corrine. It's lovely to have you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that introduction. And uh, I'm so happy to to be here on your podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, no, not one bit. It's just great. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the, her top 12 favorite varieties of bulbs that you can plant into grass that will naturalize and just get bigger and better and bolder year on year. And we're going to do that in one episode. And she's also going to give us her planting tips and honestly obey them because she knows better than anyone. And then on the following episode, we're actually going to do woodland bulbs. So we're going to do exactly the same. So in this episode, we're going to do meadow, grassland. And in the next episode, we're going to do woodland. So will you start us off, Cream, with your favorite bulb for perhaps, you know, the beginning of the year, for, so sort of mid-January onwards? Yeah, well, obviously I have many, many favorites, but if I have to name just the one, as you would call it, your desert island variety, I would immediately say the snowdrop. One of the first on show, starting in January in our country, that is, and it's brilliant in grass. And when I say grass, I mean a lawn, actually. It could also be a wildflower meadow. But in my garden and in many of my clients' gardens, I use a, no a normal lawn as my backdrop for my naturalizing bulbs. And the reason why I love Snowdrop that much is obviously because it's so early and it's, well, it, it is the joy of spring. Um, when you are down and everything is dark and then you look outside and then suddenly there they are, those lovely white little bells. And, um, well, my top one would be the, the normal fuss-free Galantis nivalis which is the ordinary and in our country native uh, snowdrop. And that's the one that will bulk up very easy. It's not easy to buy, 
as it is really hard for the growers to to um, store them. They, the, the bulbs will dry out quickly. But the best way to get them is in the green as, mm. as plants. So either your neighbor or a gardening friend might have some some leftovers. And uh, that's the best way to start. Okay. The other galantes I would like to call, like to name, it's also a nivalis, but then it's a hybrid. And that's my absolute favorite one. It's a British one. It's called Sam Arnott. Mm. And, um, well, I love it that much because it's easy and it's big. Mm. So very visible because in January, February, you're not having your al fresco <laughs> dining, but you will uh, look out your window every now and then. So either you want yeah. to see large, large uh, amounts of smaller ones like the Nivalis or the bigger ones that are very visible and that are like dots in your garden, in the grass. Well, I grow the Nivalis everywhere. Mm-hmm. And I'm very lo- lucky because there still is a grower in the Netherlands who grows a, f- a great, a great one, uh, situated in Tessel, where the traditional snowdrop growing still is going on. Uh, but it's also good, very well available in your country. I think there's mm-hmm. still some British growers as well. Yeah. And then maybe number three in that group is Elvesi. Yes. Discovered by Mr. Elwes from your country. And that's one that is such a good one because it's so early. Yeah. So it's a bit earlier than the Nivalis. So I always mix the two. So I have a longer flowering period of um, of snowdrop. Little trick that I use. And as, especially in public space. So I prolong the flowering period of snowdrops with at least two weeks. Uh, so those three are my top three of Galantis. Okay, for January into February. Yeah, yeah, they're earlier galantes, later um, galantes. Well, I'm not a galantophile. Mm. I just like to have them in my garden. They should be in every garden, actually. Yeah. And um, so that would be my number one. <laughs> Very good. And what I should have said is, Kareen does, as she referred to there. I mean, she's a really exceptional garden designer, and she does lots of public space designs and that's kind of you know her main industry she has a flower farm too a cut flower farm but her main sort of occupation is is doing these bulb planting schemes and general designs uh, for public spaces and so honestly she knows as much as anyone about how to decorate sustainably and successionally any area of grass they're just beautiful so what's your second one uh kareen your second family well, that, that's not difficult. That would be the crocus. <laughs> yeah. So the crocus is, is not a native bulb, but it's very well known and it is used in public space forever and forever because they're easy and um, they're colorful. So unlike the nivalis that is always, always white and maybe with a touch of green, crocus comes in many, many shapes, colors, Obviously, it's nice to use uh, a ton sur ton scheme uh, because there are a lot of blues and lilacs. But I love them uh, in a more carnivalesque way, as I've done with the uh, Kareen's Crocus Mix that is in your catalogue. Mm. And I, it's, it's lovely to play with them because you have the big Dutch crocus, the ones we used to hate, but actually now I love them uh, because they're big and bulky. But if you combine them with, with the smaller species ones, then you will have a lovely mix of structures and shapes. And, uh, well, they, they, well, they provide for a lovely feast in your, um, in your lawn. So if I, should, if I could name some of my favorites, but there's so many, I have so many favorites. Remember when we were in that field of spring beauty, crocus minimus spring beauty. Oh my God, that yeah. was so wonderful. That That is like a fairy tale. It's still grown. Um, it's a minimus variety, so it's a species and it's beautiful. It is white, it is lilac and a hint of purple. And that is such a good one. Another very, very good one and easy one, obviously, is the Thomasinianus. Uh, we call it a farmer's crocus. 
And that's because there used to be a lot of trade in uh, farming soil in the Netherlands. And these little crocus bulbs or seeds would hide into the soil. So if you were lucky, you, you would have bought farming soil with crocus. And that's how they were, they were spread in our country. Uh, yeah. Thomas Silvianus, yeah, it's, it's the wild crocus. Uh, it's not native here, but it's easy. It will spread. It is incredibly elegant. So the lovely crocus shape is on a white, little white stem. So if you see the white stem, then you immediately know that it's a Thomas Silvianus. And it comes in a couple of varieties, and they're all equally good. But I love these species one best because it's such a beautiful grayish, lilac-y, lovely color. And um, I, I tend to combine that with a bigger one, like the Yalta, for instance, or the Vanguard, because they have similar. They come in a similar color scheme, but they are twice as big, or sometimes even three times bigger than the flower of the Thomasinianus and they, I, I tend to I, I love that because you have a sort of mix of yes. bigger and smaller crocus yeah. makes it more playful yeah definitely and the golden crocuses because people hate yellow but I love yellow and there's so many good ones orange monarch it's not yellow it's nearly orange beautiful antrustifolia which is lovely golden yellow uh, gypsy girl the one you have in, had in your cat, catalog, purple stripes on them. They're, they're all beautiful. Okay, so I'm going to push us on now to do March. So we've got crocus fading and then scillas and kinodoxas come out, don't they? Yeah, and the, and the first uh, narcissus, but we'll talk about them a little bit later, daffodil. Um, yeah, the first scylla is probably also one of my favorites because it's always forgotten. And maybe because it has such a difficult name. It's called Scylla Mischenkoana. And it is yes. porcelain blue like the later flowering Poschkinia. Um, but it is incredibly hot, perennial, strong, Lovely, it will grow anywhere, even underneath a beach hedge or whatever. It's so good and so such a good performer. And I love to mix it uh, with snowdrops because then you mm. will add a, a hint of blue to the mix and that will make the white stronger, as we all know. Um, and they flower at the same time. So don't forget the Mischenkoana. And uh, naturally, the Siberica is a very good one, especially the Spring Beauty, because it's a bit higher. Yes, it's taller. Yes, exactly. Yeah, the grass is growing, so you need longer stems, because otherwise the flowers will get lost in your lawn. So that's why I will always choose the Siberica Spring Beauty, because it's a bit longer. Yeah, good. Yeah, so that makes four. Oh, I haven't talked about so it. So three, so kinodoxas, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we say gionodoxa in Holland, but uh, kinodoxa is fine. Um, there, there, there are several of them. There are three families, um, but I always choose the one with the longest stems when I use them in, in grass. Uh, there's a lovely yeah. one called pink giant and there's blue giant. And then you, you'll know it will be long enough enough to, well, to be in your lawn, which at that point will start to grow a bit. And you're not mowing, so um, you need the, the, the higher varieties. Especially the pink one is very perennial and that will spread quite quickly, I have experienced. So, and it's, it's a lovely, lovely soft pink. Yes, we've got that here and it's naturalized incredibly effectively actually in the vegetable garden as a path edging. It looks fabulous, so I, I totally agree. So number five is Narcissus. Yeah, we could make a whole separate podcast on Narcissus. It is such a good bulb because there's so many of them. They, the Most yeah. of them are incredibly perennial. Some of them even self-seed, which is great in a naturalizing planting. Not all of them. There are varieties that thrive in wetter conditions. There are the ones that love the drier conditions. 
they're relatively affordable uh, because they are easy to grow. They're deer proof. They're mice proof, and they're beautiful. They're, they're they come in all a, a whole range of yellows, of creams, whites, and we now have the very very on trend pink ones. So there's so much to choose from. And you're you're right, deer proof. Yeah, deer proof, and also chicken proof. So we have narcissus in our chicken run, and they don't get eaten by the hens, which is which oh, is that's amazing. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And so you already mentioned the Pushkinia uh, Libanotica, and so that's your number six. And, and yeah, so that's uh, the same color as the Scylla, isn't it? It's a bit, if I, well, I think it's a bit more blue. Yeah. A bit more. I think the Scylla Mischenkoana is, is more, is more water, watery blue. Pushkinia is really porcelain, lovely. What's your English word for that? kind of blue duck egg blue yeah yeah lovely one it stands on its own there's only one pushkinia pushkinia libanotica it's mm. uh, well uh, it's grown for years and years and that won't end hopefully no no the bulbs are still available so that's good great great and so number seven is another narcissus and you you've listed Actea, which is an absolute favorite here we've we planted 20 bulbs here on the bank on the eastmost bank uh, as you come around the end of the drive here at Perch Hill, and that's now about a thousand 15 years later so they're just so successful yeah yeah and the reason why they're successful is that in nature they grow in grass so in Switzerland in the mountains they grow there naturally and I've seen them grow there so and that is an amazing sight they're a bit like like sunflowers because they they look you in the eye that's why yeah. I love them so much with their mm -hmm. little little pheasant eyes and yeah. there's a range of poeticus varieties but the one I love best for grass is Actea and that's because it's in flower so early mm. because at some point if you want to have your lawn back and some members of my family claim their lawn back at sort of third week of may fourth week of may because they want to to do their picnics and their footballing etc and then it's over with the bulbs so actea is in that time frame in that window and um, it will flower at the same time at, as my next favorite that's the Tulipa clusiana, and then especially Lady Jane. They will flower exactly at the same time, and that combination is to die for. At that moment, when those two are flowering together, then it's hard for me to even to leave the house, to, to miss that moment that I love so much. And um, so that's a golden combination. Well, yes, Narcissus, gosh, and I love Hawera for late as well, going into May, it often flowers. Uh, that's um, just so beautiful for grass. So then uh, on to tulips, Kareen. So so which are your favorite tulips for planting in meadows or grass? Yeah, well, I know, I know in your country you tend to grow your long stem tulips in the grass as well. I haven't been experimenting with that that much but i use a couple of very good species ones i already mentioned the one i use together with the actea but the one i really love in grass and that's really perennial because that's always a bit tricky with with species tulip is uh, turkestanica yeah it's an early one it will flower in april so ahead of any other tulip and um, it is a lovely color. It, it it combines with everything. It's sort of white with gray streaks yes. on the outer petals, and it will have it's a multi stem uh, bulb. So many flowers will come from just a one bulb. And um, after flowering, you're left with lovely seed heads. So it's it's very very good and um, very good in grass. And the other one I tend to use in grass because it's so beautiful. It's the native tulip, Tulipa silvestris. Yeah, the lovely scented. Yeah. Yeah. So elegant, lovely, uh, the bended stems, and they, well, they look like little golden crowns. Mm. They could be a bit tricky, but they're so lovely that I 
I always use them. And mm. because they're native, so important as well for wildlife. Yeah. So yeah. these two um, are on my top of my list for grass. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. And then number nine is the leucogium. Yeah, leucogium. Well, there, there are two. There's, there's one in spring and one in summer, although... Well, it's it, it's not really spring nor summer, but you have the small one, the vernum, but that's not very suitable for the grass. And you have the estivum, and there's a very famous uh, cultivar called Gravity Giant, mm. uh, found by the great William Morrison, obviously. Robinson, yes. Yeah, I love it, but it needs a wet or or damp condition. But mm. if you have a lawn where the the um, water level is quite high, so a bit of a, a dampy lawn, <laughs> um, then that is great because the stems are long and very visible. And, well, it's, it's the, the, the lovely little flowers. It flowers for a long time. It's a great cut flower, so that's a bonus. Mm. You can even cut from your lawn. <laughs> Um, it spreads very well if it's happy and um, it's native. So all pluses for that all one. Pluses, yeah. 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 <laughs> As And also for damp ground, I mean, so leucogium does really well here because we're on clay. And then also for damp ground um, is your number 10, which is Fritillaria meleagris, the snake's head fritillary. Yeah, yeah. Who doesn't love that one? It, I think it's the only flower in the world that has a sort of square pattern on the petals yeah like and it, it is it's amazing flower it's native in our country as it is in yours it's extremely rare in our nature um there, there may be one or two uh places where they still grow in the wild and that's the reason for that is that um because of farming the water levels are low and it needs again it needs dampness to succeed so if you have a dry city garden you might struggle with that one mm. but if you get it going uh, on the edge of a pond or a lovely visible place then it's it's fantastic it's um i can't live without it it's beautiful yeah it's beautiful yeah yeah and then muscaris and and particularly in your list, there's azurium. Yeah. The reason why I named that one is muscari. So already, I'm not sure how it's in your garden, but I can see the foliage of muscari mm. coming up already. That could be a bore in your, um, in your grass, all that foliage. The only one who doesn't do that is the azureum. Mm. And it's quite high on its stem. It's, again, that lovely blue that we love so much. So the... Yeah. Azure blue, yeah. sky blue, and it's quite high on its stem. But there's there's a lot of new breeding going on in the Muscari world, so there's there are a lot, lot more. I love Latifolium. Mm. It's a very easy one, darker blue, but it makes a lot of leaves. So that could be in your lawn, could be a bit difficult. Mm. But it's a very good one and again quite high on its stem, so very visible. Mm. Because you need them to be above your grass, otherwise they will get lost. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, and your final number 12 is a camassia. Yes, camassia. Yeah, it's obviously not a native plant. It's an American prairie plant. It comes from the damp prairies and it's an edible bulb. It's also a cut flower. And especially the camache. And I must say, I've stolen that idea from Great Dixter when they have been in the in the meadows forever. I think Christopher Lloyd introduced them there. And I remember when I was graduating from for my uh, degree, garden and landscape design, and I made a design with camassia and grass. And then the teacher said, well, that will never happen. You cannot have mm. camassia in grass. And then I showed him the picture of Great Dixter and he said, okay. Well done. <laughs> You're right. It's okay. Excellent. You're right. Yeah. And, teaching um, the teacher. Teaching the teacher. Well, the the the, the thing is that Camassia is one of the latest of the uh, naturalizing bulbs. Well, in spring, huh? so it's flowering in May. 
So you need to adapt your mowing regime to, to keep it going. So you cannot mow your lawn. You need to at least sort of five weeks after flowering. So, mm. um, so that's the only tricky part. But again, you can use zones in your lo- lawn where you mow a little bit later or use a skies or maybe a, um, a special, um, uh, because the grass will be quite long at that point. Yeah. But it's worthwhile because they're so beautiful. And, and so um, perennial. Yeah, yeah. And perennial. And, well, they come in all kinds of blues. So the the, um, the cerulea is beautiful, but that, I think that's a bit too bulky and big for grass. So I, I love the camash in the grass. Mm. And uh, I've seen ho- the new breeding schemes with pinks are coming. Mm, so, wow. Um, <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I didn't know they were edible, Corinne, so you can eat the flowers of Camassias, can you? Well, the, the Indians, they used to, they ate the bulbs. Oh, the bulbs. They're, yeah, yeah. And um, I've never tried them, but uh, you should. <laughs> yeah, but I wonder if the flowers are edible too. They probably are. Probably, probably. Yeah. Well, not sure because the flowers of potatoes aren't edible. Well, whereas, that's true. That's yeah, true. So, <laughs> We'll have to Google that, yeah. Before we finish, I mean, that's just one. I'm just going to recap. Um, and while while I do that, will you think about maybe three points, your key three points of planting in grass and success of planting in grass? And so number one is Galanthus novalis. Number two, Crocus, but particularly Thomasinianus. Number three, the Scillas, and I can't pronounce it, Mish... Oh, Mish Koana. thank you. <laughs> no, number four, Kynodoxas. Number five, Narcissus, particularly Elka and Pseudonarcissus. Number six, Pushkinia Labanotica, Libanotica. Number seven, Narcissus Actea. Number eight, the Tulips, particularly Turkestanica and Sylvestris. Number seven, oh no, number nine, I mean, I'm going wrong here. The Leucogems, particularly East of them and Grave Tide Giant. Number 10, the Fritillaria meliagris. Number 11, Muscari, particularly Azurium. And number 12, Camassias, and particularly Cramrash. And these will all be in the podcast notes, as will more lengthy explanations that Corinne has sent us about her planting tips for grass. But if you, we could just wrap up with the three things, perhaps two or three things that you think are most critical to the success of planting into meadows or grassland, that would be brilliant, Corinne. Yeah. Well, number one top tip is plan your mowing. Mm. Don't mow too early. So you need five or six weeks after flowering of the of the last one in flower before you start mowing. That's really, really important. Mm. So if you are making a, a bulb design or if you're buying bulbs to plant in your meadow, be aware that you, that you have to wait for mowing and you need to agree upon that with the rest of the family. So that's very tricky as well in gardens, especially in public spaces where uh, companies tend to start mowing very early. So that that is very, very important. So if you want to mow early, then use early flowering varieties. Mm. And uh, if you are more patient, then you can have um, uh, fl- in April and May flowering varieties. So that's number one tip. Mm. N- number two, if you're planting in grass, you won't do that all in one go. Yeah. I add, I add, every year I add new things because I see new things and, and I add. So you need to remember, because I'm a bit like a squirrel, you hide the little yeah. bulbs and then you forget about them. And then you can end up with too much colors or too, well, too, just too much. Yeah. So remember, make pictures, especially from your bedroom window so you can yeah. have a good overview. You don't need to to make drawings, but um, make pictures and remember what you're missing. For instance, I have told you about a good combination of um, Clusiana tulip and Actea daffodil. Mm. So if you're missing one of of the two, then remember that you need to buy them this fall Mm. and to plant them. And that's the good thing about it, that you can can add to to your mix. 
Um, so make good notes, make pictures. Um, and the other tip is mow your lawn in November. So very late. Um, so your grass is not too high when the uh, first galantis will will appear. So that's a, a very useful tip. So don't leave your grass too high before winter, um, because otherwise you won't see your lovely, little, elegant flowers in spring. So give your meadow a late mow. And obviously, if you want to keep some bits of your garden a bit uh, longer because of biodiversity or you want to have more wildlife, that's okay. But um, remember that you plant your early ones on spots where you where you have done the late mowing, because otherwise you won't see anything. So that's a good tip. Fantastic, fantastic. And uh, there are many more, but um, I will I will have to write a book. You have to write a book, Green. <laughs> and also, you're coming back to join us, and um, next week we're going to talk about woodland bulbs and so we can talk more about the detail and and the expert specialist advice that you can give us all so thank you so much for being on the podcast and i'm sure you've all learned a lot and enjoyed the huge wisdom that Crean has and next week we'll do a shorter episode on woodland bulbs but following the same format which is Crean's 12 favorites for planting in woodland and shade Thank you, Sarah. It was a real pleasure to be a, a guest in your show. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Corrine on the best bulbs for naturalising in grass. And next week, she joins me again, and we're going to chat about the bulbs that thrive in dappled shade. See you then. You can find more information, photos and advice sheets on all the plants and recipes we talk about on this podcast by heading to the show notes or at sarahraven.com forward slash podcast.